sacrament. You'll find that on page 26 in the front of the hymnal. And we ask the congregation to either sing or to speak the responses as they are listed for you in the bowl. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. God invites us to come into his presence and to worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, Uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise.
I also might mention that following the second lesson today, the uh, epistle lesson, we'll be singing a response from the hymn note. Uh, you'll notice that on your bulletin. Hymn number 398, stanzas 5 to 6. Our first lesson, though, is from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, beginning in verse 1. The Valley of the Dry Bones. Most people, I think, are acquainted with the Valley of the Dry Bones. The whole point of that is to show that only God can bring to life when we feel dead, whether it's spiritually dead, whether it's dead because of emotions or things, conditions of life, and we feel separated from God, God is the only one who can draw us back together and to himself. So we read in Ezekiel chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones, and he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. <coughs> then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you. And you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound. And behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. <coughs> then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. <coughs> Behold, they say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. <coughs> we are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. Here ends the word of our Lord from the Old Testament. And now our epistle lesson for the day is recorded in Paul's letter to the Romans, the 8th chapter, beginning at verse 11. Paul also talks about the life that we have through the Spirit. Now he's thinking of the life of faith. Rather than being dead in our thoughts and in our actions and our words, we do all things to the glory of God because he has given us this new life. So he emphasizes the spiritual life that is now ours as heirs of eternity with the Savior. We read in Romans 8. And if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will also make your mortal bodies alive through his spirit who is dwelling in you. So then, brothers, we do not owe it to the sinful flesh to live in harmony with it. For if you live in harmony with the sinful flesh, you are going to die. But if by the spirit you put to death the actions of the body, you will live. Indeed, those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery so that you are afraid again, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we call out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself joins our spirit in testifying that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, we are also heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, since we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. 
Here ends the reading of the epistle. And in response to the first two lessons, we join in singing. Hymn number 398 stands as five and six. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. Many Jews had come to Mary and Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him while Mary was sitting in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha replied, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live, even if he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never perish. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. Jesus was deeply moved again as he came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Take away the stone, he said. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, because he has been four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus looked up, and he said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out with his feet and his hands bound with strips of linen and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus told them, Loose him and let him go. Therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what Jesus did believed in him. Here ends the reading of the Gospel.
Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning we're going to continue on in this Gospel of John after the Lord had raised Lazarus from the dead. This was, in one sense, the high point, or the climax, you might say, um, that the high priests and the leaders of the Jews had. Now their hatred regarding Christ had become so pronounced that there was no other way that it was going to go until Christ would be put on the cross. They just went flat out to make sure that they got rid of him. Takes place, let's see, Passover is in the March to April time period. This takes place probably a little bit after December. So he's got two to three months left uh, until his suffering and death. And after he had raised Lazarus from the dead, now this is what the leaders of the Jews said. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe on him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. In Christ Jesus, dear fellow, redeemed in our Lord. What would you think if you had come to the service today, you glanced at the bulletin, and you had seen that the guest speaker today was Louis Farrakhan? If you know who Louis Farrakhan is. Or, how would you react if you saw that the Lenten meditations this year were going to center on the memoirs of Charles Darwin, Adolf Hitler, and Osama bin Laden. What, you would say? <laughs> Those people are enemies of Christ. What in the world would they have in common, or what could they possibly say that would be of any benefit to us as Christians in our faith? Well, <laughs> it's not going to happen. <clears throat> This is a house of the only true triune God, and it is dedicated to the proclamation of the saving truths of the gospel. Its message points to Christ, and Christ alone as the only means of our salvation before God. And people like those that I've just mentioned have no part and connection with that. But sometimes God uses his enemies in this world to actually proclaim his word to the comfort and joy of his followers. Ironic, isn't it? That God would use enemies of the gospel to speak of those blessings that the enemies did not understand, nor did they believe in, and yet what they actually said was true. But you must keep this in mind. The dispensation of God moves men and moves events along to the moment and the place where his divine plan reaches its same <coughs> climax. Now let me say that again. The dispensation of God, it moves men, it moves events along to that moment and to that place where his divine plan reaches its saving climax. Or another way you could say this, the will of Almighty God is not bent to the will and the plans of little man, but little men are subject to the will and the plans of Almighty and a great God. And don't you ever forget that, especially when you begin to question the things that do go around us in our old world today. God is still supreme. God is ever in control. 
God works all things out according to his will and his plans and his purposes. And today's text is a great example of that. Here we have one of the greatest sermons that was ever preached by one of Jesus' enemies. And to make it short, you can just say, one for all. But what Jesus' enemies actually proclaimed and God carried out, though they sound familiar, they sound similar, they really have different meanings. So first, let's look at what Caiaphas meant and the counsel of human hatred that he was actually expounding here. Now go back to the gospel lesson today, and you have such a striking contrast between what is taking place here in this text and what took place just days before that when Lazarus was raised from the dead. At Bethany, at the house of Mary and Martha, we saw Jesus fully reveal himself in his tender compassion and his mercy as the Lord of life. The pity and the heavenly concern for his fallen people who were now overcome by the consequences of sin <coughs> was written all over his face by simply the act when he came to Lazarus' tomb and he wept bitterly before that tomb. He wept because of the darkness that sin had brought with death upon God's people. See, God created us to live with him and in him. He did not create us to die apart from him. And so great was Jesus' overwhelming love for sinners that he challenged this great monster death with one simple, majestic, and glorious display of power, raising Lazarus to life. See, life and love and fellowship with God it is what God wanted his people to enjoy with him. And you can imagine, perhaps, the joy that was on the faces of the sisters and the relatives and all the friends around Lazarus when Lazarus came out of death. Think of what a scene that must have been. But now, look at this picture in our text. And it takes place just a few miles away from where Lazarus was raised from the dead. Do you see any life? Do you see any love here among the rulers of the Jews? Compassion, mercy, care, heavenly concern? No, you just see hate and you see death. Here among the rulers of the people, you see sin in all of its ugly array. Now what took place was a furious debate that went back and forth between the leaders of the Jews within the Sanhedrin, and it was about Jesus. After Lazarus was raised from the dead, many people were going after Jesus, and they were putting their faith in him. And the leaders feared that so many were going to be following Jesus now that there was going to be an uprising against the Romans. And then the Romans would come and take away the power and the position and the impact that these Jews wanted for themselves. So they called this secret meeting of the Sanhedrin to discuss what they could do to stop Jesus. Now, isn't that amazing if you think about this? These were the religious and the national leaders of the day whom God had actually placed into their positions as his representatives here on earth. They were installed in order to lead the people closer to God. And as such, they ought to have been willing to accept Christ and to follow him. He had shown in so many different ways that this was not just a man, this was God's son. But often those who ought to be willing to accept and to follow Christ are more often found to be those who resist him and his work. Now, could that ever be the set of us? That we are resisting him and his work, being more concerned about ourselves and preserving the way of life that we want to live if we do not put God first, 
and first in every single aspect of our lives, every single aspect, if we do not bow to his direction, then we actually resist him, and we resist his work. And those who make Christ expendable, like these gentlemen were doing in their lives, they will not benefit through him at all. And in that, human hatred for him is revealed. If there is one truth that should hit us directly in the face with this account, it is that the thoughts and the ways of men are not the thoughts and the ways of God. So then you ask, what are our ways? What are my ways? <clears throat> See, there's no question about Caiaphas' thoughts and Caiaphas' ways. Caiaphas was not the kind to hide anything in his life. And you could almost picture him shaking his head with superiority over these 70 men who had gathered to discuss this issue when he said to them, you know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation should perish. And you think, wow, <laughs> from where does such passion of hatred arise? Christ goes around doing only good Christ goes around no threat at all to anyone's position, and Caiaphas responds, don't you guys get it? He's got to die. From where does that hatred come? Well, there's only one answer to that. It comes from spiritual ignorance and indifference that refuses to listen to the word of God and to accept God's word as truth. God actually says, it's your souls that I want. And it's still the same today. He says that to you. It's your souls that I want. But many others only want the trifles of life. Keeping their positions. Advancing their agendas. And not losing any of their material comforts. Just like Caiaphas. And so the counsel of human hatred rises against the Christ and says it is better that one man die lest we all perish. How dark the heart and how confused the mind and how foolish the judgment of anyone who wants to put Christ aside and get him out of the way so that a person can go on with the lives that they want for themselves. You know, that may be difficult for us to comprehend. I would admit that. Yet, it also serves as a warning because many have descended into that way. If we attempt to sacrifice Christ to our own wants and our own desires, we call down upon ourselves everlasting death. That's what Caiaphas did as he continued in his hateful ways. But the ironic thing is that God turns exactly what Caiaphas says around, and he changes his hateful ways into a plan of divine love by which God saves those who believe in Christ. See, Caiaphas declared, it's better that one man die and not all the people. And then the Apostle John explains what that meant, at least from God's perspective, when he says, Caiaphas did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and to make them one. Well, how about that? These words were spoken by one of the greatest scoundrels that ever disgraced the pages of history, yet they are placed on his lips by the most unlikely ways of God himself. Caiaphas meant to counsel an act of human hatred by which the rulers were going to render Christ powerless, but in reality he proclaimed words outlining God's plan of divine love that was the only way to save us. And if you capsulize it in one statement, it's one for all. See, that's the true purpose of Christ's suffering and death as the Savior. One man for the people so that the people do not all perish. 
It's an excellent summary of what Christ's ministry was here on earth. A clear statement of the purpose of his innocent death. God died for the people in their place as their substitute. The righteous for the unrighteous. You know, hundreds of years before this, Isaiah had written, the Lord has placed on him the iniquity of us all. And then the Apostle Paul wrote afterwards, after Jesus' death and ascension, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And then again Paul says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And one of the clearest and shortest of all is this, Christ died for the ungodly. Now how about that? Do you ever consider yourselves the ungodly? But that is actually what sin makes us. Sin does not draw us closer to God in any way, shape, or form and make us more godly. It does the opposite. It drives us further away from God, and it makes us ungodly. But, lest we despair, those are the very ones for whom Christ gave up his life, and for whom the Father, in his plan of divine love, sent him, so that one man would perish in place of the people. And over and over and over again, the Bible assures us that Christ died for us. That means he died in our place. That means that he was the ransom price, that he was the redeemer. And as you draw closer to Christ's passion, the celebration of that over the next two weeks, just watch him silently, lovingly, and willingly going and giving up his life that we might live before God forever. God, help us to find daily comfort and remembrance in this amazing truth. He loved me, and he gave himself for me. One for all also means one for me. God, grant that all to us in our lives of faith for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please remain standing as we now unite with all Christians in confessing our faith. Today we do that in the words of the Nicene Creed, and you'll find that on page 31 of the front of the hymn. We believe in one God, God the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, but one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seen at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Congregation may be seated. As we now worship our Lord in bringing our offerings to
drive. And if taking out your hymnals, you will turn to page, page, let's see, what page is that? 125. Not in the service of word and sacrament, but page 125. On that page, you should find the responsive prayer for the Lenten season, which we will use as the basis of our prayers this morning. And once again, we ask the congregation to speak the responses that you find in the bold print listed for you. Page 125. Heavenly Father, you loved the world and gave your Son to liberate us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. We be the best that will have your love in your hearts. Lord of the Church, we thank you for the treasure of the Gospel. By your Spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Strengthen our determination to do what pleases you no matter what the danger or the cost. Let us pray for those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom. Missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and their values as Christians. By my spirit, O Lord, grant them patience and endurance. Let us pray for those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict and personal relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, and all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Grant them peace, O Lord, and in your mercy, be their guardian and friend, their comfort and hope. Let us pray for those who care for others, pastors and counselors, physicians and nurses, social workers and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. For to them in their work, O Lord, and do not let them become weary in doing good. And in our prayers today, we include thoughts on behalf of Lucille Houston, who had gallbladder surgery just a few days ago, and also Jerry Wisner, who is not uh, doing so well at this time. We ask, Lord, that you would strengthen them in body and in spirit especially. We ask that you would be with Lucille as she recovers over the days that lie ahead and restore her strength to her so that she can return to praise you in your house. And also that you would be with Jerry and Bob as they go through the different trials that they experience. Keep Jerry strong in her faith in you and in her trust in all that you will provide for her in the days and the weeks that lie ahead. And now hear us, dear Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. O oh Lord, help us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Keep us faithful even to the point of death, that we might receive the crown of life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we join in the prayer that the Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we now return to page 33 in the front of the hymnal, in the order of service of word and sacrament. As we continue with the sacrament of Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He made his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Now may the sister body and blood given and shed for the forgiveness of all sins strengthen you and confirm you in that true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen.
service of word and sacrament on page 36 with the singing of the song of thanksgiving. may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit one God now and forever Amen. brothers and sisters go in peace live in harmony with one another and serve our Lord in gladness the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. You may be seated. <laughs> <laughs> 